It's a really interesting question. And data analysis is changing a lot in terms of what, how we do it and what we do with it as well, okay. especially within the context of long clinical studies. Mm -hmm. uh, because fMRI, because we're talking mostly about fMRI, is really based on statistics, mm -hmm. on doing averages. So, you know, the bigger the number, the better. So what we're doing more and more these days is pulling data together from different, different centers you know, when we do you know, multi-center trials. So there's some, some elements to think about when, a, when these trials are set up in terms of compatibility of equipment, uh, of different scanners from different manufacturers, different sequences. Uh, but even then, when we have the, with the data, we need to ensure the data are comparable. Uh, so there's a whole range of methodological issues to think about in this case. Um, but once, once we got the data to, for clinical use, I mean, imaging is really interesting. fMRI for the first, I mean, so for the first probably 20 years of fMRI, there was not much clinical yeah. use. Yeah. Apart from functional surgery, maybe, yes. uh, fMRI was, you know, it stopped. You know, we see what's different between our clinical population and, and or, you know, our, our control population, but that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it could, be, uh, could be used to inform potential treatment or targets for treatments or biomarkers for disease. But in terms of being useful in the clinic for patient X coming in, there was not much, not much use there. Mm -hmm. So now image analysis has moved towards more like, you know, big data, AI, machine learning. And imaging is fMRI specifically has moved more to prediction, trying to predict. So using fMRI, using normative database or using data you previously acquired, trying to predict treatment response, trying to predict disease progression uh, from imaging data, imaging and genetics, and usually a combination of various imaging modalities. Mm -hmm. So now, so the, the kind of the data themselves and what we do from the data changes all the time mm -hmm. in a way. So now we would get decision type metrics, uh, like, okay. you know, like a 50% chance of recurrence right. of, of depression, or 75% chance that this patient will respond to drug A. Yeah. for example, or to cognitive behavior therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've moved away from just measuring, mm -hmm. like, you know, effect sizes oh, wow. and things. Of course, we, we do both, but it's, it's much more exciting in the clinical realm to move towards this kind of decision-making okay. um, imaging. Uh, but fMRI itself has changed as well, because, you know, we still talk about fMRI as bold fMRI, traditional task-based fMRI. But what we do more and more, I think nearly all our protocols now have got resting state okay. uh, fMRI as well. You know, when you just don't have a task, mm. you just scan for 10 minutes uh, because we want to see what's happening in the brain at rest outside yeah. of doing any task. Because mm. we know that, you know, even when the brain is at rest, we already see differences mm. between, you know, different clinical populations, or even dif in a way, every time you look, you see differences between male and female brain, the different, you know, different ages. Uh, we already see all these differences in the resting brain. So we need to take these into account when we're building our experiments. It's not as easy as finding a baseline, because now we know yeah, no that the baseline is already shifting constantly. Mm -hmm. So we have to take this into account.